thanks, uh, Antia, for pulling together this panel and the wonderful hospitality of the organizers. Um, and to you for coming to listen to us. The one important point I want to start with is the fact that Palestinians are not hapless victims. Um, they have a voice and they've spoken. An overwhelming number of organizations in Palestinian society, almost the whole of Palestinian civil society, and almost all the cultural workers have said, we want the boycott. They are the oppressed. It's an asymmetrical situation. The people with power, as Ian has said, is the Israeli state. So in July 2005, they called for a boycott, divestment, sanctions, a BDS campaign inspired by the anti-apartheid struggle in our country. And, and what they called for is basically three things. Um, they called for uh, the ending of Israel's 1967 military occupation of Palestinian territories, ending the system of racial discrimination against Israel's Palestinian citizens, dismantling the apartheid war which the International Court of Justice in 2004 condemned, um, and of course, the uh, uh, ending the persistent denial of the UN sanctioned rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes. Those were the demands. These are not outrageous demands. It's in line with international law. It's in, in line with human rights discourse. That's vital. Uh, I think it all also distinguishes Palestine from a number of other countries where you have the organized cultural workers, civil society, who've made the call. The second point is that Israel is an apartheid state. Some call it worse than apartheid, as Robert mentioned, as Archbishop Desmond Tutu called it. Others called it apartheid of a special type, like Grand Greenstein. It's all variations. The important thing is, as Professor Dugard, international, South African voice on international human rights law, Professor Richard Falk, Princeton law professor as well, and now with the UN Human Rights Council, they all call it apartheid. They use a UN resolution. It was uh, uh, passed in 1976, and it's not specific to South Africa. Any country that practices certain discriminatory laws are guilty of the crime of apartheid, and Israel has violated this particular law. Besides these people that I've mentioned, it's also the HSRC that put together a very comprehensive scholarly, which can be downloaded free of charge, by the way, from the web, why Israel is an apartheid state. So the point is, it's not why do we single out Israel, it's why does Israel single out itself? Naomi Klein has written a brilliant piece why she supports boycott, divestment, sanctions. And she talked about, for example, at the time of the apartheid regime in South Africa, we also had the Pol Pot regime. There's no comparison between the two in terms of the number of people that were killed, genocidal. But yet the Pol Pot regime, in fact, boycotted itself. The difference, so Israel is not unique in terms of racially discriminating against indigenous people. It's certainly not uh, uh, unique in that sense, but it is remarkable um, that Israel has gotten away with its discrimination. It's genocide, the Nakba, where two thirds of the Palestinian population uh, were driven off their land. 
expelled from their villages. And Israel is seen as the victim today. It's supported by the U.S. In fact, the victims, the Palestinians in Gaza, are boycotted. <laughs> you know, it's a medieval siege there. You can't even get chocolate unless you take it through the tunnels. And the U.S. and some European Union countries have spearheaded that. There are a number of myths I brought with me the Palestinian guidelines on the boycott campaign and their call for you to have a look at yourself. BDS does not preclude joint Palestinian-Israeli cooperation projects so long as they recognize Palestinian rights, uphold the basic needs for freedom and equality, and unambiguously aim to end Israel's colonial oppression of the Palestinian people. They have set out very careful criteria. Now, many of the objections to the academic and cultural boycott are in fact based on a wrong premise that Palestinian organizations are calling for ostracizing individual Israeli academics, writers, and artists. It's far from the truth. The Palestinians have discussed with South Africans involved in the struggle to isolate the apartheid regime. And they realize that we cannot call for boycotting individual Israeli artists. It's an institutional boycott. It's the Israeli state that uses culture to disguise and hide the naked oppression. And the guidelines that I have speaks to it. Israel also whitewashes, pinkwashes, etc. the crime of apartheid very well. And this is what needs to be exposed, not individual Israeli uh, artists. In terms of the effectiveness, BDS started in 2005, I mentioned, and over a period of six to seven years, it has been incredibly effective as a vehicle to challenge Israeli impunity. Uh, the victories of the BDS campaign in such a short time far uh, overshadow what we were managed to do in that period of time in the struggle against apartheid. The call, um, and Iwok has mentioned that 1959, was the first call, 1963 was the first effective action, and we only got our elections in 1994. So the successes of the BDS campaign and its effectiveness, the fact that we are discussing apartheid now <laughs> is a success in itself. The psychological issue that Ewok talked about, Archbishop Tutu also said that for us in our struggle in the darkest days, the psychological uh, aspect of this, knowing other people support our struggle and are prepared to sacrifice, uh, and it's not lucre uh, at Sun City or any other kind of temptation. It requires sacrifice. There's a whole long list of people who have come uh, uh, to support this. The late Jill Scott Heron. Elvis Costello, the Pixies, I can go on, Madge Ryan, Dustin Hoffman turned down uh, a, a talk um, um, at uh, the Jerusalem uh, Film Festival. Uh, Roger Waters, we had John Berger. John Berger, when it comes to culture, understanding art, there's nobody as inspirational as John Berger. Judith Butler, the, as far as I'm concerned, a key living philosopher, living uh, legacy. Um, there's also people like Arundhati Roy, Augusto Boal. I'm talking to people who are playwrights here. They know the significance of people like Augusto Boal, all of them, Andre Brunk, and I can go on, have all made the point why they want to, uh, why we should boycott. I want to end by saying that academic freedom cultural expression surely under conditions of civil war, violent occupation, apartheid, colonialism, 
must bear some reference to the very conditions for the criteria of its determination. That context, to be specific about it, it's contingent on that context. Art um, can't rise above politics. Um, it does, does not operate in some special apolitical uh, space. Uh, and it is not removed from complicity in systematic human rights abuse. Israel uses culture to sell a prettier face uh, for Israel. The whole question of branding Israel, a new image, is essential to their attempt to continue to hoodwink the world. I want to say that the BDS movement is not asking for anything heroic from people of conscience. It is merely asking us to desist from complici complicity in oppression. And really the corollary of what Brooks was saying, there's a woman from the Jewish Voices for Peace who said a very vital thing. She said that Palestinians have lived for the past six decades from one trauma to another, one tragedy, one slaughter, one theft to another. And she said that in the frenzy to discredit the BDS movement, it's perversely easy for critics to forget those facts, obfuscations, canards. The US have boycotted culturally a rich society, Cuba. They've boycotted many people, so it is for me the height of hypocrisy to say why Israel, when it is the country that has violated more resolutions and conventions and treaties than any other country in the world, yet it is Israel that is pampered and privileged more than any other country in the world. If we believe in human rights, in international law, then it is the duty of every one of us to call out this hypocrisy and to specifically listen to the voices and the views of the Palestinians who are using a non-violent way of getting their li uh, rights that we today take for granted. Thank you. Thank you, Salim. <laughs> Okay, we want to bring you into the conversation, so I'm going to get up and I'm going to move around a bit. But I want to just check if the panel wants to respond to anything that was said. Um, yes, just a quick, I'll try ahead. and make this quick. Yeah. Something that um, Brooke spec, uh, touched on, <clears throat> a number of points that you made mentioned the idea that the that, that, that boycott should never be used as a blunt tool. Um, the, the Reverend Huddleston said it himself. Culture needs to be used as a tool, not a blunt object. And the fact is, as Salim has quite correctly pointed out, the Palestinian Academic Cultural Boycott Institute and the BDS movement have published very clear guidelines that make the BDS movement boycott itself a very clear, sharp, specific, targeted tool. For an example, one of them, <coughs> six or five in the guideline, the event or the project promotes false symmetry or balance. This is a guideline for a specific type of event. Cultural events and projects involving Palestinians and or Arabs and Israelis that promote balance between the two sides in presenting their respective narratives as if on par are otherwise based on the false premise that the colonizers and the colonized, the oppressors and the oppressed are equally responsible for the conflict, are intentionally deceptive, intellectually dishonest and morally reprehensible. Such events and projects often seeking to encourage dialogue or reconciliation between the two sides without addressing the requirements of justice promote the normalization of oppression and injustice. Now that is a very clear, specific, targeted point of attack. All right, again, something that is not just a blanket, blunt tool. The idea, again, of applying a boycott to a specific country, China, Korea, from without, without guidance from within, is ultimately patronizing and misguided. You know, patronizing to assume that the terms of a people's resistance should be dictated by outsiders, essentially. Okay. Uh, just a, is that on still? J just a very quick response or rejoinder, really. Um, I think it would be very difficult to expect the North Korean artistic community 
to issue uh, a memo to the outside world because they don't have access to it. And they may fear for their lives uh, or they may fear for the lives of their families. This is not an argument for boycotting North Korea. It's simply, an, it's simply a point that circumstances in the world are necessarily complex. They're not simple. I mean, it, it, in summary, the, the world is divided into people who think there are two alternatives and those who don't. Okay, wait. That would assume then, sorry, that doesn't assume then that the Palestinians that have called for the boycott are not under some sort of threats for their lives or that they're not taking some sort of risk. I didn't say that. I don't know. No, you didn't say that. You didn't. Okay. I assumed that, sorry. Let's get your questions. Let's find out what you want to ask. Okay, right. Coming back. Hello. Okay, um, I don't have a specific uh, person I want to address, but I just want to bring up two sort of points which I think are necessary to really figure out what we really need to s discuss in this debate. One is just a sort of brief point about, um, which will bring me to my second point really, about sort of the nature of why a boycott is effective in Israel as opposed to North Korea or another society. The the f I mean, obviously the first thing that springs to mind is that North Korea is a very closed society. It's not exactly as though there's a culture going in there and it's not exactly, with a few exceptions, including the National Youth Conference that had in South Africa a few years ago, it's not exactly that North Korea makes an effort to go out and convert everyone to their brand of Stalinism or whatever you want to call it. But the mo that's, that's sort of a side. But the more important point, I think, when we want to deal with, the net, and this is my main point, with the cultural boycott of Israel is the way in which Israel society views itself. And it's very similar, in fact, to how um, South Africa during apartheid to view itself, white South Africans, they viewed themselves as an outpost of the West, as a sort of colonial outpost of the West, in touch with Western civ civilization, in touch with the metropole. In in instance, if you walk around, it's still very clear in parts of South Africa, Cape Town's a good example, and in Tel Aviv, people in think themselves as a European city in within um, a non-European land. It's very much, they want to be accepted as part of the European cultural community. And there's always this need among West South Africans still to feel accepted by the European and American cultural community. And that's where the real effectiveness of a boycott can be in terms of shifting consciousness in Israel, is that if you make them feel like a pariah from, from this community, you feel that the community that you, want to, that you want to belong to doesn't want you. We don't want you. We feel that your state is not, doesn't represent our values regardless of talking about the individual merits of these countries, is that is which is the effective measure about shifting consciousness within Israel. And um, that also brings me to, I mean, a discussion of something which is not really spoken about is the nature of uh, how this manifests itself. And one of the things is quite interesting that um, Israel football teams, rather than playing in the Asian League, play in the European League. So in terms of the championship, the UEFA championship, there is, are Israeli teams competing. They just views that Israel manifests. And it's the last point I want to make is quite interesting within Israel society is that the identity of Israel is even more complex than you make it out to me. It's not just Palestinians which are being oppressed in the sense that Israel is increasingly meaning white Israel, meaning white descendants of European Jews. It doesn't mean there's a substantial proportion of Jews from uh, Ethiopian Jews who are black and uh, Jews who are from Middle Eastern descent. Even though they are accepted in legally within Israel society, they are, don't occupy positions of power, they're increasingly being marginalized. There's this identity of maintaining white Israel, and this white Israel is the European Israel. And that's another, b and the final point is that if you look at what's happening with this uh, current sort of mini pogroms against uh, refugee, black refugees, this is a manifestation of this white Israel, and that's where we need to target them. Anybody else want to add into the debate and then we can turn to the panel again? Oh, yes. I think I just have a very simple thing which is really a response to, I suppose, the, co the conversation of the two, which is that politics has to simplify things. You can't say we can't do the politics because it's too complicated. Um, it always is complicated. Every history of every country, apartheid is a complex, but there were always exceptions to the rules. But if we hadn't had the, I mean, if we hadn't imposed something the shaming that you're talking about, maybe nothing would have happened. So there is some sense in which a cultural boycott has to be simplified. I, I think I just want to put it. Yeah. Yes. 
Thank you so much for your presentations. I find as an artist, it's really interesting now to com contemplate on collaboration, on travel, on where you're traveling. And I think too few artists take the time to do that. And I would say across sectors as well, you could be in the business field, you can be in the sciences, but there are very few people who take the time out to contemplate that. And also as a hip hop artist from the States, I genuinely create and support work that supports positive energy and messages, but I do boycott any message that is demeaning to women, demeaning to society. And I was wondering if any of you can talk on specific ways and examples that cultural boycotts are tied directly to consumer boycotts. Thank you. Um, I think the argument that was made about North Korea and China and, and all these other places where there are human rights violations and so on is, is it, it, it puts us down a slippery slope because what it's asking us for essentially is complete political apathy. If we're to say that we can't um, have boycotts everywhere, therefore we shouldn't have them anywhere, I think, I think that th that's a bad argument to make. Um, and it's, it's, it's putting us into a position of political paralysis where there's so much going on that we feel that we can't do anything like, so we should just do nothing. Um, yeah, that's. Can I add a question in? I want, to, I want to ask about Swaziland, Zimbabwe, you know, these sorts of countries around us because I think, um, you know, Mark, you've made me aware I, I'm not spent time thinking about the situation in Swaziland. There's so much that's right here, you know, right within, um, you know, that, that larger Southern African space that maybe needs better attention. And, you know, while we're thinking about Swaziland, should we not think about Zimbabwe? You know, what, what are we doing here? What, what is the thoughtful approach to this? So can I add that a bit into the mix? Um, who would like to start with a response to any one of the questions? Okay. I, I, let me go back to, to the question that was posed about slippery slopes and apathy. Um, I was not, for example, saying because there is injustice in Saudi Arabia or North Korea or China or uh, Turkmenistan or Kazakhstan or the Sudan that therefore there are so many injustices that you can do nothing. Um, rather that anything you do, anything a collective does, anything an individual artist does, anything a government does, needs to take into consideration that there are lots of circumstances that require contemplation and a decision about what constitutes an appropriate response that the world b is sufficiently big that you can't ignore the oppression in North Korea simply because you wish to focus on the oppression somewhere else. The problem is in figuring out what tools and mechanisms work in place A or place B. The little colloquy we, we had, for example, in, in the case of North Korea, and I'm not a specialist in there, I've, I've actually spent about eight seconds and two, and two fifths of one foot in North Korea, so I can't claim to be a specialist. But it is clear to me that it is impossible for North Koreans individually or collectively, unless they are exiled, to make any sort of representation. Um, their circumstances are so unique. Even so, some countries, some governments, some cultural institutions felt it was appropriate and useful to make the effort, to make the connection, as in the case of travel of orchestras from the US and I think one other country who have been there, and efforts by a few European countries to actually have scientific exchanges with North Korea in spite of all. And the problem or the challenge is figuring out the mechanism that fits a society and a circumstance that doesn't at the same time take out all the other people and organizations along the way simply because you cannot easily make the distinction and therefore you just do something. Um, and that, that also, may I just segue to the, the question of, of uh, 
some, uh, politics has a, uh, politics, we, so how was it phrased, politics, uh, in politics we have a need to simplify things. Yes, we do. We have a need to simplify things. I, I agree completely. But we also have a need to remember the complexity of those things, too. And we can't simply say all countries that do X are equally complicit or equally bad, because there are degrees of badness. There are degrees of complicity. There are degrees of oppression. And some are worse than others. And we, we need to keep that in mind. We need to have enough focus on what we're doing to be able to see cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. And that's really the problem. And my own experience in working to bring a major American performing group here at the end of 1992 led me to say, if we do that, we need to be aware of the local circumstances thoroughly. We need to make sure and to ensure that all of the activities, whether it's the supporting orchestra or the workshops or the master classes or whatever the heck it was, that all of it went toward goals we had defined rather than simply accidentally accepted. So there was a need to be complicated in our simplicity. And I think that applies more generally. Right, Mike. I just want to say on the, you asked about Swaziland and Zimbabwe and the like. Mm. Um, and you know, I, what the point I was trying to make earlier was that cultural boycotts are legitimate political tactics, but mm. I think that they are most effective when they are part of a bouquet of strategies to effect mm. particular change. Because if one had to assume a particular hierarchy of boycotts, what would you put at the top, what would you put at the bottom? I would imagine the cultural boycott would be at the bottom. You know, economic sanctions would be at the top, military sanctions, those kinds of things would be much more effective ways mm. of persuading those in power to right. you know, bring about change. And I think that's what the case was in our country. The cultural boycott was the first boycott lifted after the negotiations or, or after the ANC was, was, was unbanned mm. um, as a kind of reward, a symbolic gesture to F.W. de Klerk to say, look, you have done well, you know, we're lifting the cultural boycott. And then the sports boycott, because then suddenly you had your cricket team going to India in 1992, before elections had happened, mm. so, um, but they kept the oil bo the oil boycott and the military boycott, you know, going until such time that the new constitution was in place, and until such time that election happened. So, mm. you know, for me, looking at a place like Swaziland, um, what I resent as an artist is when an artistic event like the Bushfire Festival becomes a very easy target, that you suddenly get political activists kind of targeting that particular festival because, despite it not being a supportive mm mechanism for the Swaziland regime, mm. um, you know, why not boycott the Monarchs Reed Festival or, mm. <laughs> you know, something that is, that is really significant in terms of, in terms of that. Mm. Um, you have a situation where, for example, Sul Ramaphosa, former NAM General Sec Secretary General, is the chairman of MTN's board. MTN <laughs> is invested as are many, many unions in MTN that is mm. in Swaziland, you know. Mm. Now, for, for, for Union Center to come and say to artists, you mustn't go, but we are going to be there mm, generating mm, mm. income for our union. You know, mm. it's just, mm. that kind of thing for me just doesn't fly. Yeah. So I think that, that when you're engaging in these kinds of um, activities, that there needs to be consultation yeah. across the board yeah. and that we need to come up with a concerted campaign that everyone kind of buys into and everyone understands and everyone says we're committing to that because we can see mm. the importance of this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just as, a, as an additional, would you agree then as well that it should come from within? I mean, essentially it should come from as, as much as possible, in as much as possible, it should come from the people to whatever degree they can, even if it's just a cry for help and then we pick it up, but it, it should come from as close to the problem as possible. Can I add or, I mean, are we able to just jump in on yeah. a problem because we, we recognize it and, and assume our own tactics. So can I add in, can I ask also, if it's a cultural boycott, then it involves the artists inside. You know, are they absolutely necessary in the consultation? Because it seems to me that the, you know, the big corporates, the big media corporates, sometimes the large, you know, we had state-sponsored artistic institutions in South Africa. Um, many individuals, you know, or authentic, you know, organizations on the ground can get crushed in these pro these big political processes. So can I add that on? 
Yeah. Yes, about individuals, individual artists. Yeah. Michael, do you want to maybe try and... Yeah, um, you know, sometimes artists are not very well organized uh, within particular <laughs> countries. So, yeah. so to have a voice on behalf of artists is, is sometimes quite difficult. Yeah. And part of what we are trying to do as our chill network is have exactly that. Um, one of the reasons why the arts are not taken seriously in many, in many countries, why governments sign up to major international policy instruments, why they even adopt cultural policies but never implement them is because they're never held accountable. And this, you know, artists are, <laughs> they kind of feel at the bottom end of the political food chain, but mm -hmm. then they don't organize themselves to be able to do something different mm -hmm. about it. So this is why we are engaged in that. Yeah. So I don't think it's necessarily the case that it needs to come from inside. You know, it can be part of a broader campaign, but where those organizations exist, we must make an effort to engage with them and consult with mm -hmm. them in order to make sure that those strategies are effective. When the cultural boycott, although it was called for 1959, it really only became a major part of what organizations began to do in the mid-80s, um, you know, when the disinvestment campaigns began to really take off internationally. And at, at that time, there were very few internal organizations so that the ANC actually initiated organizations like the Congress of South African Writers, FAWO, Association of Community Art Centers, and I was all part of those, you know, that particular time in the mid-80s because they needed advice from inside, from organizations about who was okay and who wasn't okay in terms of traveling abroad, et cetera. So, yeah. um, you know, there was a case of where there's an absence of organization, actually go up to organize artists in order to have that mechanism to monitor the effectiveness mm -hmm. of the boycott. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Salim, Hi. you want to? Yeah, there's a few very important things. I've listened to Mike very, very carefully <laughs> and clearly, the question of the boycott being not a dogma, not a principle, that it being a tactic, is something very important. I think all of us agree with that. The fact that people inside have a voice and, and discuss this is vital as well. Now, all those criteria are met by the BDS call very clearly. I think that many of us are involved in support for the Zimbabwean struggle, uh, for the Swazi struggle, um, even for Darfur, and, and many other struggles. We don't divide that. And the point that was made about why, particularly in terms of Israel, the BDS campaign, besides meeting these criteria, would be effective it's extremely well articulated. Israel sees itself, I mean, it's incredible, the symbolism. It's like for those of us of a certain age and, and grayness or uh, holding on to our hair, the kind of language is so familiar. The apartheid speak about the last bastion of Western civilization. Of course, people are a bit more sophisticated today, but that kind of logic, and it is tactical because it will be effective. Uh, like a knife, if it's used uh, incorrectly, it becomes blunt, it becomes ineffective. The great boycott uh, in California, called by Cesar Chavez, uh, was effective against California grapes. There are many such examples, some given by Brooks as well. Uh, I mean, it doesn't have that impact on North Korea as it would, and that is part of the tactical thing. The Cape Town Opera, I mean, Brooks, really, I support Archbishop Desmond Tutu on this issue. His statement about the hypocrisy of going there when there are Palestinians who live just a few kilometers away, but because of the apartheid wall and the apartheid policies, they can't go to the Cape Town Opera. Whereas a Jewish person in an Israeli settlement can go there. And Thea, I sent you that lovely video, I hope you saw it, about Madonna. I'm not yeah. a fan of Madonna, <laughs> and I'm not sure if this was satirical, yeah. but she was in Tel Aviv recently, mm -hmm. and these two Palestinian brothers in the West <laughs> Bank bought the tickets, yeah. and they wanted to go there. So yes. this thing about these cultural acts will really bring people together, hold hands, kiss each other, reconcile, 
is really ridiculous. You know, okay. it basically perpetuates yeah. the system. It gives the Israeli state greater legitimacy. Okay. Our aim should be to delegitimize them, to stop them from hoodwinking people. When they put those labels, it's made in Israel. We say, no, it's made in the occupied Palestinian territory according to international law. That's what we should support. This thing about... Sorry, I'll stop. Yes, okay. I do want to pick up on this statement because um, you also, Salim, you know, you had the, the litany of this person is not going, this person is not going, and so on. And quite often the choice falls on the shoulders of the individual artist. Now, if you're a big-name Madonna, um, I think it's easier. You know, you, you look... Well, I mean, Madonna, you've got, to, you've got to see the YouTube video. If you just Google it, you will find it. The two brothers try desperately to get across the wall. They can't find... There's this one very funny scene with this fellow who's on a phone asking for permission. And um, he needs a directive from a higher authority. And, of course, all he has is a ticket that he's bought. He doesn't have a directive from a higher authority. And, you know, that brings us to satire. Satire plays a role here, too. But I, I am very interested in... You know, are we, are we saying to, I mean, Madonna can take, can take advice and she can certainly look around her and see, you know, what other artists have decided to do. But, you know, in the case of an individual company and, you know, we, we're asking people to be incredibly politically savvy. Um, very, and it seems to me that you, the panel, are saying to us that, in fact, there's not a one-size-fit-all boycott. There is, there is a very careful, sensitive understanding the situation, knowing what the politics are, getting the context right, and then making choices and decisions based on that. So I want you to answer the question about that individual artist. Very quickly, and I, you know, Robert wants to hear Yeah, just use the mic. <clears throat> and maybe Mike too, because Precisely. having lived through these... I agree completely. That's why in South Africa uh, and in many other countries, you have now groups called um, uh, South African Artists United Against Apartheid. I mean, uh, Ian talked about that, Joni is here, there are many other people who have studied the thing, uh, talked to other artists around the world, talked to Palestinian and Israeli artists. There are many Israeli artists who support uh, Jewish artists who support the boycott campaign, like they were white South Africans, you know, it's not surprising. So there are nuances, and people are learning, and they make mistakes. They make mistakes like we made mistakes. And in every struggle, I was telling Mike, uh, we were involved in the boycott campaign, but there were things that, were happen ha that happened there that we're not proud of. There were gatekeepers that more often than not, they were then checked and there was a struggle within the struggle. It is complex in that sense. Uh, the nuances are important. The most important thing, as Anthea has said, is to understand the facts because there is so many, you know, the crudest form is that you are anti-Israel, you are anti-Semitic. That is the crudest form. Of course, it becomes more sophisticated. But that kind of canard doesn't hold true any longer. Most artists, because of the boycott campaign, have educated people about this issue. So I think there are organizations to go to. There is a vibrant debate and, you know, far from curtailing freedom of expression and creativity, in fact, the struggle has resulted in a flourishing debate and greater clarity. And all the time we are learning and enriching that. Okay, Robert. Thank you. I think the points have been very well covered by my colleagues on the panel. I think I just want to make and reinforce the point uh, about uh, how do you choose between one, which country and another and I think the, the point very powerfully for me is that in these countries we can make a difference. Uh, Brooks, as an American citizen, it's the American government's support for the Israeli regime that's able to maintain the regime in that particular location and its geopolitical role within the Middle East. As an American citizen, you need to stand up and say, I do not support the way that my government is supporting 
the Israeli government in terms of the occupation, in terms of the settlements, in terms of a whole range of human rights abuses. That's where your voice can be heard. Your voice would not have as much power if it had been in uh, a country like North Korea because, of course, it's an isolated country. But that's precisely the point why you should be uh, being an active voice in relation to what's happening in Israel because it can make a difference. Since okay. 2000, America has exercised its veto nine out of ten times. In those nine occasions, it's been in support of Israel in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Okay, I'm going to bring in somebody here who wants to comment. One really important thing to think about that if you are in the American media and you're working for the American media and you say anything about Israel, you are blacklisted immediately. There was a woman, Helen Thomas, she was a press representative at, at the presidential place at the White House and such, and that actually happened to her. So she did experience that, and I saw her speak at this lovely venue called Busboys and Poets that brings people together in D.C. and to speak on progressive topics such as this, which I think is a very important issue to consider as well. So that's it, far from even curtailing freedom of speech. And I have you know? one more thing to mention. One thing to keep in mind is that for U.S. foreign aid, the top country that receives foreign aid is Israel. Probably, so yeah. it's very interesting. So the, the argument that is thrown against boycott, divestment, and sanctions all the time is you're curtailing freedom of speech. And as you can see, not just with BDS, but with like organizations like that, far from it, the minute we recognize that freedom of speech is not being observed, platforms are created for it because we know that freedom of speech ultimately is going to be what drives this movement forward. You know, <laughs> Your comment was also about it consumer and yeah, the consumer boycott and the cultural boycott and in a number of ways I think one of the ways that they are the same is awareness obviously when we choose to culturally boycott we are creating awareness among the public why are you choosing to do that why are you choosing not to go there this is why the occupation the same with the economic boycott why are we boycotting these why do we want labels why are we not uh, asking for Israeli goods the same because of the occupation so there's an awareness thing that happens at the same time and then at a level of let's say Madonna you know, if large artists, Elvis Costello, Pink Floyd, are pulling out, they're also pulling capital out of that country, huge capital, because those are major, major big concerts and big events that are putting capital and injecting it into the occupation or the illegal apartheid economy. And by pulling out, they are effectively contributing to an economic boycott at the same time. So they can work together. Okay, I'm going to come to Brooks, but I do want to say, I mean, what Robert has made us aware of is not just this kind of case-by-case -case country analysis that needs to be done. There's a geopolitical analysis here. And what we have is our superpower, you know, in the mix here. So, Brooks, we know you don't represent this U.S. government. No, I don't. And you are the lone American on the panel. I mean, it, but, it, it, you know, could you address that too? Think well, about that. It's yeah. become something of my fate living here to somehow be the default de facto explainer of things American. I mean, Feels radio. very familiar. We did that in the 80s, didn't mm -hmm. we, as South Africans? I'm, I, I do a lot of it, and I, it sometimes I wish that the, uh, the embassy or other voices would be more visible because I don't like being the only one. Um, but having said that, I, I think two parts to this. First, I, I think in response to the particular interjection, um, I, I've made my feelings fairly clear uh, both uh, in print here on, on TV uh, and in my communications uh, to the U.S. government more generally, um, I don't happen to have a huge animus toward the government on all things. I disagree on, on some things, and when I think that's the case, I say it. Uh, does it mean the, the embassy here loves me enormously as a result of that? Uh, no. Uh, does it mean I get invited to the good parties? No. Does it mean that they answer my questions? Absolutely, uh, because now they're a little worried. Um, but as far as citizens are, are concerned more generally, th there is a lot of discussion, and uh, I don't want to use the word agitation, but there is a, a great deal of churning of discussion. Now, I mean, in the case of Helen Thomas, I think it was an unusual circumstance in a way she went beyond a certain line that is sort of standard in political public discourse. A lot of people were uncomfortable with the way she said what she said, and she's paid a price for having done that. Uh, any number of people who disagree with U.S. government positions on Israel 
voice it all the time uh, within Congress, in the media, and other places. Um, having said that, um, the sing and, and one needs to understand this too, and it's something I spend a lot of time trying to explain to people. If you want to find the, pl the locus for American support for Israel in an unconditional way, as opposed to an argumentative, they shouldn't do this, they shouldn't do that, if you want to find the unconditional support base, you look at the Christian fundamentalist, charismatic voter. There are 35 million fundamentalist Christian charismatic voters in the United States. There are 70 some million such people. So some children don't vote, obviously. It is the single largest repository demographically of Republican support. So if you are really concerned with whether a voice is being made, the solution is to become a fundamentalist Christian charismatic minister and make your voice known. There you go. Yeah. Hallelujah. Um, I have the microphone too, that's great. Um, but no, in, in all seriousness, that is, without that support, the Republican Party would never have won either the 2000 or 2004 election, uh, putting aside the fact whether they won the 2001 in the first place, 2000 election in the first place. But it is, a, it is the single largest repository now of electoral support for the Republican Party and a significant number of congressmen and senators. So that is where the real locus of influence now within the automatic, reflexive, instinctual support for uh, Israel on any circumstance. The second thing I wanted to mention briefly, when we talked about the Cape Town Opera trip to Israel, I was, I, I was not among the Kumbaya singing choir. All right? I said there were some very specific things that you had to do in order to be able to be both true to your own circumstances historically, the nature of this society, and the ability of your using art for the purposes of political activity, for the purposes of advancing a particular set of goals. No, it was not simply to say, you're all welcome to come to visit the performances. It was, as I, as I explained at the beginning, to make sure that as a part of the trip, tickets were not just available theoretically, but available actually that workshops, master classes. You are not going to change the essential nature of the difficulty in moving from uh, Bet Yamin to Tel Aviv simply by virtue of that one act. You may, in fact, begin to have some impact on the way other Israelis believe their own society is put together. And that was, what, that was how I described this as a process as opposed to simply a um, an official labeling of an event as open and free for all. And I, I, I was trying to be very, and in fact I had this conversation with the head of the Cape Town Opera. I said you need to set out a series of goals, objectives, checkpoints that you want to see achieved. I, I want to just um, confirm the fact that it is nuanced um, and that there never can be a one-size-fits-all. Um, so I want to make that very clear um, and that coercion will never work anyway. Um, but at the same time, it is a lot simpler than what is being implied. And one of the myths is that it's so very, very complicated. Um, it actually is not complicated. The Palestinian society have made a direct call. Whether others can or can't is actually not, it, it, it's, 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 it's a spurious, um, as you say, it leads to paralysis. Um, the situation there as well, there is an in, um, Israel is enormously powerful in terms of its Hasbara, its propaganda. We know that as South Africans, how, how powerful propaganda is. We don't know how critically dire the situation is in Palestine. We don't have much more time 
for endlessly civilized conversations. We do need to reach a point, we do need to set a timeline. We do need to say, we know how to do this, we've been there. As Mike and Salim said, we've made mistakes. Um, we know what the mistakes are. We are so well equipped to set up a timeline and say, this is, this, this is where we're going to act, this is where we're going to be in solidarity. And also that it is an incredibly powerful thing. We're 80,000 people in London. Um, I can remember that so distinctly um, as being one of the first times I could raise my head in a long time um, as an activist because I otherwise felt so in incredibly alienated and alone. And the fact that there were those 80,000 people on the other side was unspeakably powerful. Um, so I think that uh, the conversation tends to get a little too civilized. Uh, I can say that in conclusion. What I'm going to do is take all these questions and then we can all have a final say. But please, you. I, I have a question, I suppose a two-part question, but I speak as a Zimbabwean, and um, when you talk about cultural boycotts, for me, it doesn't resonate at all because what you, had, what you have in Zimbabwe is a situation where some artists have started boycotting the Harare International Festival of the Arts, and they've made this decision, and it's supposed to be this big thing, this declaration, but it doesn't resonate with the people that are struggling in Zimbabwe, because for them, that's an overestimation of the arts. The arts are not integral, an integral part of their lives, because they're struggling to survive. And so the people you're trying to connect with don't connect at all, don't make the connections with the artists that are saying, we're not coming to Zimbabwe. And then, it, I suppose, you get to a point where these artists are not coming through and there's a chance that there is no festival next year. And in a city where there's 93% unemployment, where that one week of that festival has provided employment for a number of people that would never have had anything to have that year, you have created a situation where their well-being as well is threatened. And so how, what role then at that point does cultural boycotting take? Because one, you're, the people you're trying to support don't relate to such... To, to, to the arts in that way. And secondly, their well-being is being taken away for that one week, which would have been an integral part of their lives in the way the arts are not. Cool. Cool. Is this the last hand, or is there anybody one else one? who wants to get in? Um, is there another one? Yeah. Yeah, there. Okay, um, I just have two quick points. One sort of a minor quibble with uh, Brooks. I mean, I guess he's being picked on, but it's just um, something he said earlier. Um, when you said that the major repository of um, sort of electoral support in terms of demographic base uh, for um, Israel for unconditional support for Israel, um, yeah, th it is the evangelical community, and that's an undeniable fact. But what's curious, I mean, and is that at times the Democratic Party, with maybe a few exceptions in Congress, is as reflexively pro-Israel, even if they talk a little bit differently. Mm. If you look, in fact, at the history of United States relations with Israel. Um, some of the harshest, if we call, use the sort of term, hawks on Israel have been Democrats or ex-Democrats like Joseph Lieberman. But the, it's just, I think the question, of, yeah, the question is, um, yeah, is really how did um, the United States, some at least elements of society, re regard Israel as like the 51st state of America? It's something which you find often that there's sort of this intimate connection as a country. And the second point is question is for everyone, and it's a bit minor, it's something I've always been debating with myself, is um, just in terms of travel to Israel. I mean, you have the option as going as a tourist, if you want to go to the West Bank, if you want to see the country. What is your responsibility as an activist, as someone who's committed to the cause, about traveling to Israel? I mean, I've always wanted to go, but I've got problems with it. Uh, uh, it's just a couple of things. Uh, Brooks mentioned uh, the fundamentalist Christian support in America. Um, quite recently, CBS 60 Minutes program um, really explored the situation of the Christians in Palestine, their dire situation. And actually, that, um, there was then a huge flood of comment and support. And I'm quite sure um, a lot of... Uh, the fundamentalist Christians had to look at the stance that they've been taking. The other thing was that um, I've always felt uh, that a lot of artists in this country, 
and, and important people in theatre feel that the cultural boycott here um, affected audience education. I know Ralph Lawson, for one, has expressed that opinion to me, that it was a tragedy that for so many years um, people, uh, meaningful uh, ideas, uh, were, were withheld from people here. But that will never happen to Israel because there are, it has huge support, the Israeli government has huge support outside Israel and there are um, uh, so many wonderfully talented uh, Jewish um, artists who, who will continue to support Israel. Some of them are beginning to be embarrassed. And I think um, the point you made was a very good one. That's what we want to do, is actually make the people who really matter, the people who are supporting Israel now, feel really awkward and embarrassed and, and saddened by what their government is doing, as, as we felt during um, the apartheid era. And in fact, I think perhaps one of the reasons why one feels so passionate about this issue is not that one is anti-Semitic, but that it is so close to you. I have Jewish members of my family and I feel very deeply um, saddened for their sake that this is happening in Israel. So we are so close, unlike the Northern Koreans, frankly I wouldn't even know how to begin to tackle that problem. I think yes. Um, can I, I'm going to start with Mike because he hasn't said a hell of a lot. <laughs> yeah, take this one. Okay. okay, maybe just to respond to a couple of things. Um, on the issue of whether to travel to Israel or not, you know, my own position is that I, with regard to the cultural boycott of Israel, I would support the notion of not traveling there much more on the basis of the expression of moral outrage than on the basis of of political strategy, because for a country in terms of international power relations that is supported by the USA, that sees that has no compunction about boarding a flotilla of ships in international waters, a cultural boycott as a change political tactic is gonna make no difference. So for me, it's an expression of moral outrage as to whether I go there or not. not. Um, and if I do, then it will be on the basis of consultations with friends and colleagues in, in Palestine. Um, secondly, with regard to it's funny that we should be talking about this because I think one of the first plays I did in Grahamstown after engaging in a cultural boycott of the Grahamstown Festival <laughs> was something called um, Some of Our Best Friends Are Cultural Workers. <laughs> 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 and it was a satire with a colleague of mine from the from Congress of South African Writers and we were being satirical about the cultural desk. Um, but, you know, to plug the, the Brothers in Blood, another play that I have here at the moment, actually speaks to some of the things that, that, that um, you know, Brooks was speaking to earlier on about it's quite often we see the issue as being a Muslim, Jewish kind of country, but actually it's religious fundamentalism of Christians that most kind of dictate to a large extent American foreign policy to some extent, you know. Um, I think maybe just a, a final thing with regard to Zimbabwe, I think you're completely and utterly right, and, and that's what I was trying to talk about in terms of the presentation I was making from within an African experience where so few countries actually support the arts. In fact, for them, if, they are, if there is no art, it would actually be better, you know, because sometimes artists can be problematic by raising issues of, of criticism and the like. And so this is why we see it as our role has been important to support artists in order for them to be exercising freedom of largely critical expression. But having said that, to come back to an earlier point that you raised, um, you know, you were talking about artists needing to be informed. For me, there is absolutely no excuse for artists not to be informed. Absolutely no excuse for artists not to be informed, other than their own laziness. And I think it's one of the things that really irritates me about artists, is, act is that actually they, they, you know, they kind of have this notion of art for its own sake, not recognizing at all that art and culture happens within a struggle for political hegemony, a struggle for ideas, and whether they recognize it or not, that's where they are located. Mm -hmm. And if they are not recognizing it, then you know, they're on the wrong side. There's a fascinating letter I saw written by Reverend um, Aronson 
Stian van der Merve, who used to be a colleague of Bayes Nudier, Martha Momberg, uh, Dudu Masangu, etc., against Reverend Mashua, uh, Mushwe. <laughs> Mushwe, who is part of that radical right wing Christian fundamentalist who's linked to the very people Brooks in, in the States. It's the same logic. Uh, and of course, they're a powerful force. But there are a number of Christians, even evangelical Christians, who are challenging them. They are not as formidable. I mean, they have terrible positions on uh, um, um, LGBTI people, on women's rights, reproductive rights, and it's a particular worldview which is very interestingly supportive of Israel. Um, so, you know, I think that particular essay, um, a letter, is fascinating because of its lyricism as well. And it addresses many of the issues we're talking about. Why single out Israel? It addresses that very clearly and talks about the terrible plight of Palestinian Christians and how they've been driven out of Jerusalem increasingly as we speak. These settlements continue. Children get detained. There are a number of political prisoners, etc., etc. I can go on. Um, and I think there are a number of groups. There's the ecumenical accompaniment program. Uh, young Christians going to Palestine and seeing for themselves. There's this open Shahuda street in South Africa, which does the same in Hebron the kind of things happening there. And I want to encourage people to go there, not for holiday, to have a good time, to scuba dive in Elat or whatever, but to look at solidarity and to look at how people are resisting in a united way throughout the world. You know, there were moments in modern history when the whole of humanity came together. It happened during the Spanish Civil War during the struggle against American imperialism in Vietnam, the struggle against racism in Southern Africa. And now they say the moment have, has arrived for Palestinians. And when I think of young Americans like Rachel Corey, who paid the ultimate price, their lives, in solidarity with Palestinians, there are many other Americans and Europeans and South Africans in our country, in fact, apartheid in a sense, still exists, the suspicion, the walls, uh, literally and metaphorically. But it's through the solidarity movement, in fact, that we are breaking down our own walls in the Palestinian solidarity movement in South Africa, many of whom are involved in Zimbabwean struggle, etc. They are people who come from different religious backgrounds, different colors, and I know this sounds all great, etc., but it's a reality. I've met more people in this country involved singularly, passionately about the struggle, Jewish people, Christians, atheists, etc., black and white, and that movement is vital. Uh, for me uh, as well. So I think this is the way to build bridges. And Samora Machal's quote, you know, that we use so often in the 80s, it's almost a cliche. Uh, solidarity is not an act of charity, uh, but it's really uh, support between allies fighting in different terrains. Uh, this is what the Palestinians and others, in fact, expect of us as South Africans who benefited from uh, this solidarity of people uh, around the world. And we have a uh, possibility of uh, uh, you know, uh, contributing to that international movement. Salim has very eloquently captured my own thoughts on, on this. I want to restate that. Um, but I also want to say there's another way of looking at culture as an act of resistance. And for me, the illustration is the East West Ivan Orchestra started by Edward Said and Daniel Barenboim. And there's a wonderful documentary which we hope to screen in, in Rhodes at some point on this orchestra. And one very poignant moment in that documentary is when the uh, Israeli youth and the Jewish youth go with the East West Ivan uh, Orchestra to go perform 
in the occupied territories. They actually performed at the Cultural Palace in Ramallah. And they had to be smuggled in under the very noses of the Israeli security forces. And I think that is an illustration of the possibilities of culture transcending the divide. Um, and what I think was also very interesting for me was what uh, Edward Said and Daniel Barenboim were trying to suggest with that act. He said it's not just symbolic. When we brought to, together these Israeli youth and these Arabic youth in an orchestra, we found that through engaging in music, through a nonviolent form of action around the issue, and what they would do is, Barenboim would lead them in the day around orchestral arrangements, etc., and Said would lead them in the evening on a master class on the Middle East, and just think about that. And the result of that was a orchestra that is fated around the world, and people go, for example, to the proms to go and see the East-West Divine Orchestra, not because they just represent the symbolism of uh, pan-Arabic and Israeli youth being able to work together, but the fact that they are world-class, fantastic orchestra, that people queued around the Barbican to see the orchestra, and I believe for the first time in the history of the proms, they're going to perform all of Beethoven's con uh, uh, concerts and uh, performances. Um, and I think that is the power of the possibility of culture as an act of resistance. And that's what I would point to as, as we boycott, we also look to these other forms of, of cultural action and which we need to support. And then on visiting Israel, my own view is we shouldn't be visiting Israel. We should be visiting the occupied territories as acts of, of solidarity. I, for myself, who for 30 years has been aware of the Palestinian struggle, I've also been aware, for example, there's another country which um, my, my consciousness was raised not to support and not to, to visit, and that's Turkey. A lot of Africans visit Turkey because of the oppression of the Kurdish people. And I think that's settled in one's consciousness, and it's how then one actually gets to understand it's not the issue of Turkey, but it's about what resistance is going on around the Kurdish people in terms of their culture and supporting that, in terms of voices that are not ordinarily heard. And I think to speak out and say, Consciously, I'm not going to Israel for this reason, but I'm going to try, because you'll have to try and get in there. It's not going to be easy to get in there. I am going to try and get into Ramallah as an act of resistance, even if it is a symbolic act of resistance, I think is the way for us to, to help support this, this campaign. Thank you. Um, I, I was actually very heartened by what Robert just said about the East-West Divan Orchestra, because to some degree that echoes my explanation of what I suspected was the right approach for Cape Town Opera to take, to use their participation in the world of culture as a way of making a political difference, even as they are artistically and aesthetically valid, um, forcing people who want them to come to bend themselves to the needs of the, gro of the visiting organization is an act of proactive participation in the political sphere from the world of culture. And let me just now go through a couple of points. For, to, to the individual who said, um, things are simple and we've had too much civility. Um, well, no, the problem is things are complicated and it is our task to somehow to simplify complexity without traducing the nature of the complexity. You have, you have an obligation to be honest about what it is you're seeing, as well as being clear. And you can't simply sacrifice the one for the other. Um, with, to the student from Zimbabwe uh, who posed a dichotomy between participation in culture and participation in the economy, you're absolutely right. It's really an, inv an in it's an invidious division, and it's not fair. And you shouldn't, and the Zimbabwean artist and the unemployed Zimbabwean uh, person doing work in the, uh, the in the cultural festival shouldn't have to make that choice. Unfortunately, that's the way the world sometimes fits together, and it requires people to find clever ways to make the cultural point through the economic or the economic through the cultural point. I, I wish I had a simple answer for you. Um, I think that uh, Philip de Villiers' point was that individual artists, unfortunately, are forced with that, and they have an obligation to somehow make that choice for themselves. But you're absolutely right. It's not, it, isn't, it simply isn't fair to the person 
who was unemployed and who was counting on that participation as a way of feeding their family for the rest of the year. Grahamstown Festival is no different. There's 70% unemployment in this immediate area. Some people, some people make do for the rest of the year on, on what they earn for the three weeks of the festival, the run-in, and the breakdown. And I've talked to any number of such people. And if this festival were boycotted for a political reason, I'm not entirely sure what the right response would be. And I think it would be the same, the same set of questions and contradictions and, and difficulties. Uh, quickly on the US uh, electoral process, two points apply. Most people in the US, congressmen, senators, are not elected on a national basis. They're elected district by district by district, of course. And as a result, people are often victorious or defeated on local issues, but also on the basis of pressures and interests. So that if you have a congressman in a city, uh, in, one, in any particular city, they're going to make choices about what they support in the interest of gaining voters, in the interest of gaining political support, in the interest of gaining financial contributions, in the interest of simply wanting to identify with something that others do. The difficulty for outsiders to understand about the United States, and I don't have a simple answer for you, Americans have come to believe that in a difficult, dangerous part of the world, the Middle East, the Israeli state represents a political structure that is by and large democratic and by and large aligned to US interests in that region. Like it or dislike it, that's the prevailing view for most people. The, po the polls say that to you over and over and over again. Uh, and it, it isn't even a function of whether you're Republican or Democratic. It isn't, even, it isn't even a function of whether or not you are the evangelical, fundamentalist Christian uh, voter. Most Americans feel that way. The number is somewhere in the neighborhood of 85%, uh, which is a considerable weight, because 15% usually doesn't win you an election. The question about the evangelical Christians, they are not, for the most part, lining up on the side of Israel on the basis of specific political or strategic policies. They are lining up uh, with Israel for eschatological reasons, for the primacy and immediacy of predictions in the last half of the book of Revelations. And you may, you may or may not want to, want to be in that place in your head, but that's where they are. And if that's true, then the politics of a place have very little to do with their actual feeling about this. It has everything to do with this grand eschatological view of the immediacy of the end. Now, not everybody wakes up in the morning and say, today is the last day of society, so I better do this. But many people believe in the immediacy of it. Uh, you, can, you can make a fairly good living writing a book about the end of days in the United States, but they're read here too. Um, as to the question of Christian Palestinians, yes, but the question of how American evangelical fundamentalist Christians, they're not primarily worried about the question of Palestinian Christians as much as they are of this grand scheme of things. Uh, they may take some uncertainty and some awkwardness about the circumstances of Palestinian Christians but that isn't the primary motor of their view on the issue. Um, as to whether uh, one should visit Israel, and if so, in what way and how, um, I'm sorry, where did that question come from? Oh, yeah. Um, about four or five years ago, I, I went to Israel for the first time. Um, but I made sure in my own circumstances that although I was there to see Israeli theater, which was vibrant and exciting, uh, I also carved out time for myself to um, go off to the West Bank with a friend outside of the quote unquote organized program. Uh, we used two taxis, a bus, and um, a couple of other things, and we got to where we were supposed to go. And to my, my wife just shook her head when she heard about this. What is wrong with you? I, I, when I got into a Palestinian Arab 
theater company's offices. I said, excuse me, can I use your internet connection, please? I have to transfer funds in my bank account to my credit card because I had to pay the hotel bill. And somebody Brooks, obviously can you make was this a bit shorter? Yeah. We need to get in and we need to Somebody was forward. reading my, my internet mail because my suitcase took three, three days to get to me after I arrived. But be that as it may, yes, you should go. And I think you should go because it's important to see the, the reality of a circumstance on the ground, if you can, if your circumstances permit. I also talked to Christian Palestinian Israelis in Haifa and spent time looking at, at their needs, interests, and priorities. Okay. And I guess Can I hand over to Ian? I was going to say, and yeah. I'll end Thank on you. that. Yeah. Because that's my, that's that's my last note. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. So uh, okay. Quickly, sorry, two points. The sister from Zimbabwe. I've attended Haifa a number of times. I've performed there a number of times. I've worked a lot with different Zimbabwean artists. I was unaware that this year or that there was a cultural boycott that was being implicated for Haifa. I'm definitely going to go in and try and find out more about it. I think it just speaks to the idea that possibly maybe Zimbabwe is not a place where a cultural boycott would work and would achieve its effective goal. And then we talk about, again, the idea that Israel specifically uses culture as a weapon of oppression, and that is why a cultural boycott is effective in Israel. Chances are it's not effective in Zimbabwe for exactly those reasons. But as I say, it's something that would need to be examined if there is indeed a cultural boycott being called. Again, it needs to be approached with that sharp knife and not that blunt object. So you're absolutely right. You know. Um, two, that leads on to the second point. Uh, the other reason, and I'd like to reiterate it, even though it's been made, but I think it's very important, important, as you pointed out, another thing that makes Israel so unique, the reason we choose Israel and not China, and that is the amount of support Israel receives. We cannot discount that fact that five billion US dollars a year goes to Israel, three billion of which is used specifically for military aid. That Israel, again, has in fact signaled itself out. It's put itself out there. It's made itself the target that it is. That is what makes Israel unique and why we choose to and are able to so actively bo uh, boycott Israel. And then the third and the final point I'd like to go on. The time for civil discussion is, I reckon, as well, indeed, over. I don't think that there can be any neutrality in the situation, I'm afraid to say. Uh, a quote from Desmond Tutu, during the apartheid struggle, investing in apartheid South Africa was not seen as a political act. Divesting was. That's a very important thing to remember. People don't want to make a choice. I don't want to make a choice. But what they don't realize is by not making a choice, you are making a choice, right? And uh, definitely, as South Africans, I'd like to leave on this note, in the wording of the boycott divestment sanctions call itself. South Africa appears a number of times. This is not just us contributing to this global thing. We are being targeted specifically as South Africans because of our history in the wording itself. The Palestinian campaign is inspired by the historic role played by people of conscience in the international community of scholars and intellectuals who have shouldered the moral responsibility to fight injustice as exemplified in their struggle to abolish apartheid in South Africa through diverse forms of boycott. As South Africans, there is no neutrality here. Not choosing to act is as much of a political act as choosing to act is. Thank you, Ian. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I want to thank the panel. Um, each one of these people has given a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of thought, a lot of themselves. Um, to make these statements, make these choices, speak about them publicly. So I'm very grateful to you for the time you've given us this afternoon, and thank you very much. Thank you for.